Hello to all our listeners joining the Aerospace Ambition podcast. This is Marius with my co-host Kieran. In this episode, we explore the significant field of chase experiments in aviation, where one aircraft, which is equipped with sensors, flies closely behind another aircraft to analyze the impact of its engine wake. Additionally, we'll cover the latest discoveries from those chase experiments using alternative fuels. We are fortunate to have a renowned guest with us to shed more light on these subjects. Kieran, could you introduce who we are speaking with today? Today we're joined by Dr. Richard Moore. Richard is a research physical scientist who joined NASA's Langley Research Center's Science Directorate in 2014. He plays a pivotal role in the NASA Langley Aerosol Research Group and the NASA Langley LiDAR Applications Group focusing on the study of atmospheric aerosols and their effects on air quality, clouds and climate. His work, driven by the goal of enhancing our understanding of atmospheric components through NASA's Spaceborne Remote Sensors, involves using instrumented aircraft like the NASA DC-8, P-3B and C-130 to directly observe aerosols and trace gases in the atmosphere and to link them to emission sources. Richard, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you, Richard, and uh, I'd like to start off with uh, just a personal note. I looked into the resources that you shared with us before this interview, and uh, there, of course, were also some videos of those interesting experiments, and there's a five-minute video. I'm going to link it in the show notes, uh, showing some impressions of, you know, research aircraft, different ones taking off in Langley, conducting those wake experiments, and I have to say, I did have some goosebumps here and there. I have to admit that. And um, so my question would be, when was the last time that you were flying in the wake of another airplane and how turbulent do I have to imagine it? Yeah, uh, so our, our most recent experiment actually just wrapped up this past October uh, where we were flying the NASA DC-8 aircraft. This is a large four engine aircraft in the exhaust wake of a, a new Boeing 737-10 aircraft. So a little smaller than the DC-8 but still a, a very substantial aircraft. Um, we were about five miles in trail. And so there's a, a balance in how we conduct these chase studies. We wanna be close enough that the exhaust plume is still very distinct from the background atmosphere, that we're not hunting for a very small signal amongst a sea of, of natural aerosols or, or pollutants in the upper atmosphere. Uh, but also, we need time uh, for the, the plume and the contrail to evolve and, and get to a point where we can actually measure it by our uh, instruments. And so uh, about five miles in trail uh, strikes a, a nice balance there. And so that's where we, we sat most of the time. And so at that distance, uh, it's actually very comfortable to be in the plume. There isn't a lot of um, uh, turbulence uh, as long as uh, we don't hit the, the center of the vortex. And that's the that's the job of the pilots. The the pilots are, you know, many of the experiments that we do, uh, the pilots are flying the aircraft around, but are are mainly driving the bus, as they like to joke. Uh, the action is happening <laughs> in the back of the plane. These experiments are very different. The pilots are are um, very actively engaged in the science definition and science execution because they're the ones who have to put our inlets, our our probes, our sensors directly into the part of the contrail that we're interested in studying. Uh, but also, we, we know that there are hazardous areas in the contrail, the, the vortexes that are shed by the lead aircraft where we could easily get rolled or find ourselves upside down. And so there, it's their job to keep us out of those so that we can be safe. And so they have the most important job on the plane, as always. <laughs> does sound absolutely terrifying, but I'm sure, like you say, <laughs> It's all very safe under the circumstances. So I just want to take a step back a little bit and think more about the the broader role of NASA in sustainable aviation, because, I mean, NASA is typically seen, I mean, amongst the entire global population as a space authority. So you typically think of rocket science and you think of satellites and a lot of things which are going on outside of our atmosphere. Um, so what, what is the role that NASA plays in sustainable aviation? Absolutely. NASA plays multiple roles. So as you know, we are a space agency, and space is a great vantage point 
to study actually our Earth. Most of the time we think about looking out from the Earth, uh, but the satellites whizzing up above our head, many of them are pointing down at us, profiling what's happening at the Earth's surface and, and in the Earth's atmosphere. And even as that view is just outstanding for capturing the changes that are happening uh, to our world, uh, space is also still a, a far away, a long way away. And so we require um, a fleet of aircraft, uh, instrumented aircraft, to fly through the atmosphere uh, to, to give us the validation, to give us the additional context for what those satellites are seeing um, at the global scale. And so that's where the, the fleet of um, flying laboratories that NASA fields really play a, a critical role. In addition to that, the first A of NASA is aeronautics. And so it can uh, you know, oftentimes be, be hard, forgotten that NASA hails from the, the origins of aviation, and in, in particular, uh, the National Advisory Council for Aeronautics that, uh, that pioneered some of the earliest technological and um, innovative aspects of flight. And so we have a very strong aeronautics research mission directorate focused on the newest aircraft designs, the newest uh, aircraft propulsion systems. And so it's the combination of these two disciplinary uh, fields, aeronautics and earth science, that allows us to make a, a, an impact in this, this area of contrails. Yeah, it's really fascinating because you're taking, of course, the outer space measurements that we take of uh, to, to measure the, the climate impacts that are occurring on the Earth's surface, um, but quite often they're not at a high, re high enough resolution or they don't quite go far enough for uh, to, to increase the accuracy to where we need it. So that's why we need aircraft within the atmosphere, taking measurements. And I think that nicely leads on to your personal role in, in, in the company. So could you elaborate on exactly what it is that you do? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm an aerosol scientist. I, I study atmospheric particles. These are 10, 100,000 nanometer particles that are floating around in Earth's atmosphere. And these come from a variety of different sources, not just aircraft engines. So we see particles coming up uh, from bubble bursting over Earth's oceans, uh, the smoke particles and aerosols that come out of biomass burning and wildfire plumes, and, uh, and the gases and, and particles emitted by trees, those um, nice smelling orange and, and lemon uh, type compounds that we know photooxidize in the atmosphere and actually form particles. And so we apply these uh, instruments to a variety of different topics. We're doing a project right now in Eastern Asia, looking at air quality in cities. Um, and then the project that I talked about before in collaboration with Boeing and other partners, uh, looking at the particles coming out of the tailpipe, if you will, of, of aircraft engines and how those evolve into to contrails. So what we do is we put instruments, chemical instruments that you might buy for your chemistry laboratory uh, and we engineer them to not, not be on a bench in a laboratory somewhere, but to be on an airplane. And so we install them in racks, we certify them for um, their engineering loads. They need to survive uh, the, the high G forces that we might experience in flight. And then we also have to automate them in many cases in order to make sure that uh, they can work continuously under a, a wide variety of pressures and temperatures and, and force environments. And we take the, the aircraft up into the atmosphere and we measure what's happening sort of in the soup, right right at where the action is, in the contrail, um, in order to, to give us that really detailed chemical, physical perspective of what's happening as the particles come out of the engine and the water condenses on them and the, the contrail forms and spreads into a, a contrail series cloud. Before we further dive into the exact kinds of experiments that uh, you conduct, I'm located in Munich. So, of course, I have Oberpfaffenhofen right around the corner. And I could see that in many of the experiments, you're working together with the German Aerospace Center. So um, on which topics do you actually collaborate with the DLR? And um, yeah, how do typical collaborations look like? Yeah, so one of the really exciting aspects of this research area is that it's global, right? Aviation is global. Um, it's not just a single country or a single engine company or, or airframer. Everybody 
across the globe is, is focused on how to make aviation more sustainable. And that leads to some of these enduring partnerships that we've had. And one of the most successful has been with DLR, the, the German Aerospace Center. We've been working with DLR for decades. Uh, as you know, they have a very uh, strong and, and complementary uh, set of expertise, uh, pioneering some of the earliest studies looking at contrails, looking at aircraft engine exhaust, and that continues to this day. And so it's, it's always great when we can work with them, either a, a project that we're leading in the United States or a project that they're leading in Germany or in Europe, um, and marshal our forces together so that we're, we're bringing uh, complementary instruments um, and also in many cases, duplicate instruments. There's value in having similar capabilities to be able to cross compare. And in the unfortunate case where maybe an instrument malfunctions, we can rely on the, the other team for, um, for a backup. Um, but most, in, most importantly, they're a great group to work with. It's fun. And it's, it's fun to get together with other experts in this field. And I feel like when we do projects together, um, the, uh, the level of science and the level of discourse is, is just that much higher. That sounds like great teamwork. Yeah. And uh, zooming in a little bit on those kinds of chase plane experiments, I'm really curious to learn about how those experiments go about. You mentioned that the most recent one was in October, and that suggests to me that they don't take place very frequently because there's so much effort involved. I can only try to imagine. I, I, I would like to understand what does a typical chase experiment look like? Yeah, absolutely. No, that's true. Flight testing, it really is the gold standard, um, but it's also very technically challenging. And so when we undertake those efforts, we're looking at very specific hypotheses, very si specific science questions, usually that are born out of a more sustained research or, or modeling program. And so uh, the, the flight test that we just completed in collaboration with DLR, uh, Boeing, GE Aerospace, United, and, and the Federal Aviation Administration here in the U United States um, took place this past October. And we're interested in understanding contrail formation and the evolution of, of soot particle emissions uh, from sustainable aviation fuel. And SAFs are a, a a really hot topic right now. Um, we're looking at the, the future of aviation and the need to reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and get to that net zero CO2 emissions for, the, for the, the sector. What we found from previous work as well is that these SAFs actually clean are, are cleaner burning. Uh, they emit less soot than their conventional petroleum-based fuels. And we think that's because they don't contain particle precursors, things like aromatic compounds that can uh, form soot during the combustion process, or sulfur compounds that, that go out and nucleate sulfuric acid droplets that also can form particles. And so we were interested in understanding as we start to transition the fleet to 100% sustainable aviation fuel away from these um, fossil fuel jet A's, um, what is going to be the impact on the particle emissions and, and the contrail formation? And we've done some work in the past in that area. So we did two projects, again, in collaboration with DLR, using aircraft that, that we had easy access to. So we used NASA's DC-8 back in 2014 in order to study, uh, at that time, a blend of sustainable fuel. Um, and then in 2018, we used the, the German A320, the ATRA, that DLR owns, and we use that as the fuel burner also to study fuel blends. And what we found was that uh, blending the, the fuel with the, the sustainable aviation fuel results in a, a roughly 50% reduction in both the, the soot particle emissions and the ice crystals uh, in the contrails that form from them. What was exciting about those studies and, and is that, that what that means is that fuel effects can be a uh, an attractive option for potentially reducing contrails and the, the climate impact of contrails. But these are older engines, and we wanted to look at what's coming off the, the production line now. And so that's what led to the, the collaboration with Boeing in 2023, looking at the emissions not from the older uh, families, older generation engines, but the, the brand new CFM Leap 1B engines that are on these 737-10s. 
And these are some of the cleanest burning, lowest emitting engines currently on the market. And so it's the best of both worlds. We have the, the advanced technology, low emitting particle engines, and the 100% sustainable aviation fuels that we expect should result in lower particle emissions as well. So just to conclude, you've got yeah. Uh, that basically, to use SAF, you're you're reducing the aromatic content of the fuel based on the reduced aromatic compounds in uh, sustainable aviation fuels compared to kerosene or your conventional fuels, and that leads to a reduction in contrails because you've got less soot particles to nucleate ice crystals. Um, so is this like a, a roughly linear decrease in the amount of contrails that we see based on the reduction in aromatic content, or is it yeah, what, what, what's the what's the relationship there? That yeah, that's a great question, and I'd say it depends. And and this this is where the modelers tell us that using conventional engine technologies, uh, where which tend to be produce a, a fair amount of soot, it's exactly as you say, reducing the soot results in a linear reduction in the ice crystals because the the soot are the seeds for for forming those ice crystals and the contrails. And so when you think about that, as we reduce the number of ice crystals, the, the amount of water vapor is the same. And so we're growing those crystals to be larger. They'll sediment out faster. And, and in theory, the lifetime of the, the contrail should decrease as well. So there's a benefit from reducing the, the number of ice crystals in that regime. As we get into these modern engines like the Leap 1Bs, where we've reduced the soot particle emissions down so far, that they almost don't play a role anymore, that we start to see the, the emergence of other particles, either those that were already up in the upper atmosphere or other particle emission sources, like if there's any oil vapor that, that can be used to, to nucleate new particles, uh, that can start to play a role and, and maybe fill in the gap uh, left by those, those soot particles. And so under what, what the modelers tell us is this soot poor regime, things get a little more complicated um, in the sense that it's not that nice linear response. And so we're looking at that right now and that may inform how we uh, start to handle things like oil, engine oil venting um, and, and be smarter about that. Yes, it's really interesting because we did have a very similar conversation with our previous guest, Dr. Roger Tio. Um, and he said that he really, really appreciates your work. We asked him to ask you a question on whatever he was discussing at the time. And his question for you was, what are the most recent results regarding the formation of contrail ice crystals using clean or next generation engines? So everything that we've talked about so far in this episode, basically, and the, the latest experiments that you've been carrying out. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I really admire and respect Roger's work. He's been at the forefront of some of the, the exciting modeling work that's been happening uh, over the past couple of years now. Um, so yeah, he's getting at, at the heart of this question about as we reduce the soot particles, what is the impact on, on the contrails? Um, and so we the, the, the results that we were seeing from this most recent test, we got up there and we're in the plume. We, we, can, we can feel it in the seat of your pants, there's a little bit of a rumble as the, as the plane uh, feels the, the turbulence. Uh, and we can see the enhancement in the carbon dioxide signal indicating that we're in the plume. We also see a really big spike in total particle concentration, but the non-volatile particles, the, the soot particles, actually were very difficult to discern. We were sort of staring, squinting at the monitors trying to figure out, is there an enhancement in the soot? Um, and of course, we were also measuring contrail ice. And so even as the soot particles almost went away to, to d levels that were very difficult for us to detect, we're still seeing other particles being emitted from the engines, and we're still seeing contrail ice forming. Uh, and so one of the challenges that we have, and, and we're looking at this very closely now, is quantifying precisely how many ice crystals formed and relating that back to the fuel burn from the, the lead aircraft. And that's a non-trivial exercise. So I'm gonna wait to, to make a conclusion until we have the results of that analysis. Uh, but it was, it was very apparent in real time that it was hard to see the soot. So that's a success. Uh, but 
there is this presence of other particles and we need to investigate where they come from. And oil, oil venting could be a prime candidate. Uh, small amounts of sulfur contamination uh, in the fuel system may also be another candidate. And so that's something that uh, I think the air framers and engine manufacturers are, are gonna look at very closely. Yeah, I think that Airbus are quite heavily involved in in this this area, looking into how um, pr uh, particular lubricants and fuel additives do contribute to contra formation through the emission of additional particulates. So yeah, really fascinating area for sure. And and each engine company has a different approach. And and when we think about this, we're looking at these contrail effects associated with engineering decisions that were made years or decades ago for, for very different reasons. And so, uh, for example, if you look at the CFM engines, they vent the oil at the center line of the tail cone into the hot exhaust. And so for a normal uh, CFM engine, like those on the DC-8, that oil vapor comes out and mixes with the hot exhaust plume. And as it cools, that oil just condenses on the existing soot particles. It doesn't create new particles. It just adds, adds a little bit of a coating to the existing soot. And, and there's no real impact on the number of particles emitted or, or the contrail formation. But for these super clean leap engines that are not emitting very much soot, suddenly we're, we're venting this vapor into a, a particle poor environment. And so the vapor becomes super saturated and actually nucleates lots and lots of very small particles. And so the benefit that we had realized from, from venting at the tail cone um, maybe is, is no longer a benefit for these very clean engines. And of course, you talk to the, the maintainers, you talk to the, uh, the people who were handling the oil systems, they're very surprised to learn that oil is a concern because typically a plane takes off, it lands, maybe it's used up, but burned off a milliliter of oil in an entire eight or 10 hour flight. That's nothing, right? Um, but when you think about the number of five, 10 nanometer particles that come, come out of that milliliter of oil, you're talking about billions of particles. And so it can be substantial when we're thinking about these very small scales. Wow, <laughs> that is insane. And you've mentioned the Leap uh, 1B engine. In that context, I'd like to throw in um, some other terms because they might fit in this uh, discussion here and like to um, get your explanation of what it is. It's the first time we speak about this. But uh, recently we had Alejandro Block on from IATA and IATA has a position paper out there regarding non-CO2 effects. And They say that uh, there are technological options which are promising to reduce NOx emissions, for example, um, including lean burn and advanced rich burn quick quench lean combustors. Also, the third option that they uh, mention is the future potential to inject atomized water droplets for cooling the engine airflow during takeoff. So these terms, could you maybe quickly elaborate on um, what these technologies are and how promising you find them? Yeah, absolutely. And and I, I as a atmospheric scientist and an aerosol scientist, I'm probably less qualified to talk about the the details about the combustion methodologies. But essentially what we're what we're trying to get at with these new techniques is this trade-off between fuel efficiency which is going to lead us to higher combustion temperatures, higher pressures in the combustor. Um, and the formation of nitrogen oxides or NOx that form under these high temperature combustion conditions. And so what these new techniques, whether it's running the combustor fuel lean, where stoichiometrically we add more air than we need to sustain the combustion reaction in order to maybe keep the combustor a little cooler uh, than, than we might otherwise have, Or, or atomizing water droplets into the, the engine airflow, again, to have a very similar effect. Um, it, it's trying to reduce the NOx emissions that come with these advancements in higher temperature, higher pressure engines. And of course, that's where we want to be for fuel efficiency and improving our propulsion efficiencies. And so there, 
that's the trade that regulators and engine companies are having to make as we start to look to what's going to allow us to uh, keep aviation going in a sustainable way. And how big would you estimate this potential for improvement with these technologies? Yeah, I think it. I, I think it's great. I mean, and it depends also on the the portfolio of options that we want to think about as we're starting to think about getting to our net zero CO2 emissions goals, as well as to reducing contrails. Um, there's technology options, these advanced, as you said, combustors, whether it's the, the advanced RQL, the, the lean burn, the atomized water droplet cooled engines, um, bringing in sustainable aviation fuels that we know are, are cleaner burning. And of course, have no fossil CO2 emissions, um, and then potentially other operational methods that we can use to maybe fly the airplanes around or above or below uh, moist areas of the atmosphere and forming contrails. And so it's these co this three-legged stool, if you will, of technology, fuels, and operations that are going to allow us to, uh, to reduce aviation's environmental impact. And each, each is equally as promising and probably we'll have to rely on all three. And you've already laid out that SAF uh, certainly does play a role, right, in uh, reducing uh, contrails. And my question would be, I mean, there are different kinds of SAF, right? And uh, each experiment that you conduct is, is very resource intense and takes a lot of time to conduct. And, uh, for example, biofuels in terms of scalability and also in terms of the entire life cycle impact, right, um, may, may not be the ones that we are doing in the long term. That, that we are using in the long term. And so as there are different kinds of SAF, how does this work together with, you know, the flight experiments? Um, how do you then decide, well, let's pick that SAF for this study um, and not another one? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And and I, I'll admit I'm using the word SAF a little loosely here to, to mean that um, the, the, the SAFs that we have been looking at almost exclusively in these flight test experiments that have zero sulfur and zero aromatics in them are called hydrotreated esters and fatty acid or HEFA fuels. And so these are some of the most widely available SAFs currently on the market. Um, and they have these beneficial properties. The zero aromatics reduce the soot, the zero sulfur content reduces the formation of those sulfuric acid droplets. But there are other SAFs that are being produced from other feedstocks that may have aromatic species and that may have cyclic uh, carbonaceous compounds that could actually produce soot similar to Jet A um, and, and the petroleum-based fuels. And so we may not get as much of a benefit in terms of soot particle reductions from some SAFs versus others. And there's been a lot of talk about um, drop-in SAFs. And, and so the, the drop-in being, uh, we can fly the sustainable aviation fuel on current airframes, current engine combustors without any modifications. Whereas the 100% the HEFA, because it has 0% aromatics, isn't currently certified for flight on uh, all aircraft. There's also the option to uh, to use e-fuels, which would um, basically is, is relying on, on on hydrogen and then green uh, green energy to to be produced. This seems to be the long-term solution. Yeah. So now the question is: At what point are you starting to use this stuff for uh, the flight experiments? Right. Well, you know, part of it is that we we want to understand the link between the fuel chemistry and the particle emissions that come out of the engine. And so to do that, we're being very selective in choosing the fuels with the properties that, that are going to achieve that, that benefit. And so what we've shown from the HEFA series of, of flight tests is that the zero aromatic, zero sulfur result in these particle reductions. But as we start to alter the, the cyclic or straight chain nature of the, the carbonaceous compounds, in the fuels, of course, we'll want to see how those would then feed into soot formation or, or particle production going forward. The challenge we have is that those fuels are still in their infancy. Um, there's companies that are being spun up through efforts in the US and Europe 
uh, and around the world to develop new sustainable aviation fuels from new feedstocks. But we don't yet have those in appreciable quantities to, to test on, on aircraft and see how they, they work out. The, the other thing is, I, you know, I've talked exclusively about emissions, uh, but there's this other side of the coin as well related to the, the operability of the fuel, how well it performs in the existing aircraft with the, the existing engines and fuel systems and pumps. And so really at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. Uh, the, the aviation sector has zero tolerance for uh, changes in, in fuels that are gonna affect safety. And so we, since safety is, is the paramount guiding factor here as we design these new fuels, we need to be looking at, do these fuels uh, have the properties that we need in order to, to fly safely? And so that's what the engineers and scientists are looking at as they bring these new fuels to the market. And then the environmental benefits that we might see from them are a second consideration. I'd have one follow-up question to that point regarding how to invest the research resources. And that is uh, with the recent one of the recent papers from Roger Teo, uh, it became clear that the contrary climate forcing depends on the region as well, right, where you fly. And so I was wondering, how could you then apply those results from the experiments, uh, for example, of a flight campaign in the US to other regions? Or is there also a prioritization that needs to be done, right? Because it is different for every region of the earth. Yeah, no, that that's a great point. It, It affects the region. There's a regional aspect, um, and then there's a there's operational aspects as well. When we think about traffic, say going from North America to to Europe, often we find that the eastbound flights take place at night, and the westbound flights take place during the day. And so, as we think about the climate impacts of the contrails being formed from those different transatlantic flights, we might think about how to strategically implement a limited amount of sustainable aviation fuel or a limited number of, of advanced technology engines in order to have the biggest bang for our buck. And so in the long term, of course, we would love to be have every airplane with a low emitting engine burning 100% sustainable aviation fuel. But over the next few decades, we're in a scarce situation where our demand exceeds the supply for those those solutions. And so we need to think smartly about how we we implement them. And this is where Roger's work and, and those of the, the modeling community really are, are critical because they can look at the contrails being simulated in the model environment and say, oh, maybe we should be fueling our, um, our westbound flights from Europe with SAF in order to reduce the contrail formation for those those contrails because we know that they're going to persist into the nighttime when they're going to have the biggest climate warming impact. Uh, whereas the eastbound flights, well, those those contrails will persist into the daytime and actually have a short wave cooling impact. And so we, we might not want to intervene there and prevent those from forming because they're actually having a beneficial cooling effect. And, and that's something that we can't get at experimentally. The, the evolution and life cycle of the contrails hours and days removed from when the plane flies through the airspace is not the sort of thing that we can observe or measure except from a model or except from a satellite. Have you done any modeling looking into the climate forcing that results from the burning of SAF in comparison to kerosene related to the, the actual contrail that forms and the The, the properties of the ice crystals that form as a result of um, burning SAF? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and so that's been looked at for these conventional rich burn, soot rich engines, uh, where we see the reduction in soot particles and the reduction in ice crystals coming from uh, adopting either a 50% blend of SAF or 100% SAF. And there is an effect, and and so it's been articulated that's on the order of a, a few tens of percent reduction in in the radiative forcing. When we start getting down into that uh, much cleaner environment, the soot poor regime, if you will, with these these lean burn engines, as I said, things get a, get a little more complicated because the external factors come into play. What is the the concentration of particles 
in the ambient environment. Uh, was there any sulfur contamination? One of the things that we always sort of scratch our heads about with these flight experiments is that uh, we see an unexpected result where we're forming lots of, of volatile particles that we didn't expect to see. Is it because we weren't careful about handling our fuel somewhere in that supply chain? Um, maybe it left the refinery with zero sulfur, but it got loaded on a truck that somebody hadn't steam cleaned. And, and suddenly our fuel is contaminated with um, trace amounts of sulfur, right? A few parts per million in some cases uh, can be enough to, to contaminate the batch according to the modelers. Um, so again, it comes back to those five, 10 nanometer particles. You really don't need much uh, on a mass basis of sulfur to, to produce a lot of particles. Yeah, so a tiny amount of contamination can result in potentially huge effects on the on the contrail scale exactly wow this is a challenge that we're looking at now as we conduct these experiments we rely on standard astm methodologies for testing the fuel uh, the specifications for sulfur are that it has to be under 3000 parts per million of fuel sulfur content and our astm analog analytical methodologies are, are very appropriate for verifying that specification. But if we're trying to quantify sub PPM levels of fuel sulfur content, the ASTM test doesn't meet our needs. And so in talking to the modelers, we need to actually be quantifying these concentrations down to the parts per trillion or parts per billion level. Um, and so we need new testing methodologies to keep up. And I think we're gonna see that come online as well. And can you directly derive uh, the, the climate forcing or the climate impact of a contrail from these measurement studies, from these experiments, or does it require much more additional modeling to, to go down that route? Yeah, so I, it's, it's really very much a modeling question. And so you, you imagine we're flying through this, this airspace, um, we're forming a contrail, we can see it. We're, we're five, the, the lead aircraft is five miles ahead of us. And we're very much in the early stages of that contrail. So it, the, the aircraft is five miles ahead of us. So the contrail is seconds old. Um, and as it uh, evolves over the intervening minutes and hours, it's gonna spread, assuming it persists, into a large cirrus deck. And that's where the modelers tell us the most substantial component of the, the climate impact is gonna come from. Not that initial linear contrail, but the contrail cirrus cloud that that it evolved into, and so that's not the sort of thing that we can loiter up there and just sort of <laughs> me measure as it evolves. So we're we're going to have to rely on different tools, and so that may be satellites looking down, uh, that may be ground-based cameras looking up that are able to discern it, um, or or a model uh, environment that that probably is going to be the most most ideal. Um, the, the challenge we have with all those solutions, at least the observational solutions, is that the, the contrail doesn't stay put. It's not like we can fly over a camera and the contrail stays where it is and we can watch it evolve. There's quite a bit of wind shear at those altitudes. And so uh, the contrail gets blown away and, and mixed in with other existing cirrus. And so a lot of the efforts being done from the satellite algorithm community is actually trying to deconvolve this complicated scene of contrail cirrus, natural cirrus, and then other line-shaped features within the, the Earth, like coastlines or frontal systems or uh, gravity waves, all, all of these other things that can naturally occur. So it, it's a very, very tricky problem. Yeah, so I think the answer to my question is that sensing onboard aircraft can give you an initial sort of inkling as to, to what ha might happen with the contrail formation and maybe give you some idea of how it might persist in the atmosphere, but you you really need an assimilation of different observations combined with modeling to determine what might happen uh, in terms of the evolution of that contrail and its resulting climate impact. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I guess this begs the question, what is really holding us back when it comes to putting humidity sensors on board all aircraft? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> that, uh, what what are the limitations question. there in terms of like, yeah, 
the additional weight, maybe the the additional costs, it, or maybe more development of technology that's required in the future. So stepping back a little bit, you're asking a, an excellent question, and and so uh, the idea here is that we have these models to simulate the evolution of the contrail that we know has formed, or to predict it for for uh, aircraft that are flying through our, our model space. Um, but the model is only as good as the meteorological information that's that the model is sitting on top of. And we get that meteorolo meteorological information from the, the various national weather services, ECMWF in Europe, um, the WARF model or uh, NOAA's models in the United States. And they tend to be really good at predicting whether it's going to rain today or tomorrow or the, you know, the sensible weather at the surface, but not always so good at predicting the supersaturation environment of the upper troposphere. And so we need better observational constraints, better data to help inform and improve those model forecasts. And that's to your point about, about sensors, we need we could even leverage the existing aircraft flying through the atmosphere in order to provide the the measurements of temperature and humidity that could inform and constrain those models and so the dream is that every aircraft would have a temperature sense sensor they do they already have a temperature sensor but it the current temperature sensors are not suitable for detecting the um, tenth of a degree or a few tenths of a degree precision that we would need to calculate the the supersaturation of of a, a cirrus cloud and then we'd also need a water vapor measurement and this is where things get a little tricky because we have some really outstanding measurements of water vapor on our research aircraft we shoot a laser out of a, a window an optical window on the aircraft and it hits a retro reflector a piece of roadside material that we've glued to the, the winglets or the side of the engine nacelle, and the light comes back, and we've tuned the laser, laser wavelength to match up with uh, a wavelength that water vapor absorbs. And so by measuring the differential absorption of light from our laser, we're able to very precisely measure the water vapor concentration in the atmosphere. And so that'd be the ideal. But of course, when you think about it, um, the, the palatability of shooting lasers out of commercial aircraft uh, we've, you know, on the ground or in flight is, is a non-starter for much of the fleet. We, we have people working on the aircraft, baggage handlers and other gate personnel. We, we can't have uh, laser eye hazards um, introduced. And so we need an, another way to approach this. And so that has led to some development of small sensors, robust sensors, that can be widely distributed across the aircraft fleets. And that comes with a cost. So we're, we're gaining portability, we're gaining low cost, but we're giving up, in many cases, the expense of accuracy. And so making that trade, I think, is what we're looking at right now as a community. Uh, how much accuracy can we give up in the name of simplicity and low cost? That old engineering problem. Yeah. So we, we had Professor Stephen Barrett on the show a few episodes ago. Um, we had this, uh, this topic was part of the discussion. And he said that he likes to view long-term research from the perspective of a sci-fi show, something like Star Trek. So, so you're really thinking outside the box when it comes to these concepts. And he was saying, rather than having a sensor that senses in situ, you sort of have a sensor which can read ahead of, of uh, the aircraft's uh, current position, yeah. maybe like a LIDAR detector to determine what the humidity might be ahead of the aircraft and therefore can tell you whether you're going to fly through a control and, uh, before you even get to that position. Sure. Is that something that you could envisage maybe in, I don't know, a few decades time or who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll say that we we can envision it now. We have oh, wow. lidars okay. um, that that are able to measure. We shoot. We, NASA has a, a water vapor lidar. We actually flew it during the experiment we conducted this last October. Um, instead of pointing it out from the aircraft, we point it straight down. And so we're you can imagine we're measuring a curtain 
of water vapor concentrations below the aircraft, giving us that vertical slice of the atmosphere where the, the water vapor uh, field is. And I'll say that as outstanding as that measurement is, it's very challenging to make a laser measurement from an airplane within the national airspace. Um, you know, lasers are, are a, a, a safety topic, um, not only for, you know, people on the ground who might inadvertently look up as the plane uh, walks by. We, we have to think about that. We have to calculate that risk. But if we were to overfly another aircraft and whether that laser were to strike the cockpit and, and have a startle hazard. And so we'd have to think carefully about the safety aspects of shooting a laser out at a horizontal direction um, and, and what that would gain us. Um, the other aspect is how far would you have to go for it to be meaningful, right? So aircraft are flying along 150, 200 meters a second. And so if you're going out 10 kilometers in front of the aircraft, you've just bought yourself maybe 20 or 30 seconds of, of warning. Is that worth it? Or do you, do you need more uh, timely information? Um, but, it, but it's an excellent question. Um, the, the approach that I think industry is most interested in is leveraging these in situ sensors, pulling in the air where the aircraft is and measuring the water vapor concentration right next to where we're measuring the temperature measurements. And that's gonna give us the most accurate uh, humidity that, that we need. Um, and I think it's, it's reasonable to say that if we're measuring ice supersaturation where the aircraft is, these regions tend to be horizontally wide, but vertically thin. And so it's, it's reasonable to expect that the, uh, the aircraft is gonna be, uh, be in that region for, for some time, especially if you couple it with a model. Um, if, you, if you have a model prediction saying we expect a, a moist region here and the aircraft goes up and verifies that in real time, th that's the best of all worlds. Right. This was very insightful and uh, uh, look into the future, let's say. I wasn't aware of all the effects um, or considerations with regards to lasers, to be quite honest. So, so really something um, I, I learned today. It's a very challenging question, particularly for us at NASA, because we, we work a lot with lasers and collaborating with the FAA. And as we've discussed before, when it comes to aviation, safety is paramount. And so that's, that's our focus. We've talked a lot about the usage of SAF to um, potentially mitigate contrails and, of course, sensing on board aircraft to detect and to, to measure the presence of contrails and then the use of modeling to back up these measurements and to determine how these contrails might evolve and their ensuing climate impact. So this all nicely sort of leads towards the topic of contrail avoidance, um, which is something we talk a lot about on the show and it's yeah so it's the idea of avoiding ice, ice supersaturated regions where we're likely to form persistent contrails which may cause a significant warming to the climate so what do you think about the based on the current understanding of contrails um, and the uncertainties that still exist do you think that we should be going ahead with contrail avoidance now <laughs> yeah, that that's that's a great question, um, and I'll say that that at NASA we're really trying to get our he heads around this, um, and I think it's uh, we, we've we've avoided using the term contrail avoidance, and and actually the term that I've heard that I like the the best is is contrail management, and so reflecting on. It's not as simple as just avoiding all ice supersaturated regions or avoiding all contrails. That's, we think, overly simplistic. That we need to be thinking about this holistically and taking into account the complicated atmospheric states. So is this contrail going to be net warming or cooling? Um, and is it going to be significantly warming? Um, and then what other factors are being brought to bear here? Is it a advanced lean burn or advanced RQL type engine? 
Is it burning 100% SAF or, or a SAF blend? Um, and so bringing in all of that information, then we have to make a decision on whether it's best to take action. And so if we decide that it's in our interest to try to take some sort of action, what action would we take? And would that action be better for the environment or would actually make things worse? And so if it's as simple as maybe changing our flight level from 36,000 to 38,000 feet, and the aircraft has the maneuverability to accomplish that, that's an easy one. But if it means that we add an extra hour to our flights to go around this moist region, um, we're gonna burn more CO2, which is gonna be with us for a long time. And there's gonna be operational ripples throughout the national airspace as we think about what that's going to do about aircraft arrivals and people making connections and so forth. And so I think it's a very complicated problem and how we bring together the meteorology and the atmospheric models that we we're working on most most actively right now to make them better to improve our confidence in their their accuracy and veracity combined with the operational uh, uh, network aspects that are going to be have to be used to manage those and so I think and and right now we should absolutely be looking at this and studying this and potentially even doing some pilot runs about how we might accomplish this in the future. Um, but the other aspect of this that I think is gives us some hope is that contrails are relatively short-lived, unlike CO2, which is with us for, for decades. And so we have some time. We have time to figure this out. We have time to figure this out and do it well. Um, and so if we start now, Hopefully, we'll be in a position in the next couple decades to start um, actively managing contrails um, in a smart way. So I think based on your area of expertise, aerosol science, I think it's uh, highly relevant to discuss the topic of aerosol cloud interactions, which are a significant source of uncertainty in contrail modeling um, and contrail science on the whole. So. Could you break down what this really means from a from a scientific perspective? So the 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 phenomenon of aerosol cloud interactions and why there's so much uncertainty surrounding this concept. Absolutely. And and I'll say one of the reasons why this is so mysterious is because we're so um, terse or loose with our, our terminology here. And so when we think about these particles that are coming out of the engine exhaust the soot particles, the sulfuric acid droplets. Um, if we're flying through a humid, moist atmosphere that's cold enough, we're gonna form a contrail that may form a contrail cirrus cloud. And we, we, can, we can see that, we can link those emissions directly to that contrail, directly to that cirrus cloud, and we can model its climate impact. And so that's what we're talking about when we're trying to um, quantify this contrail cirrus effect on climate. But those particles persist even as that cloud may sublimate or, or disappear. They're still up in the atmosphere. Or maybe we didn't form a contrail at all, but we're still emitting particles into the atmosphere. And so the next question is the downstream effects of what, how those particles interact with the natural environment. And so we know that naturally occurring cirrus clouds nucleate ice crystals on existing particles. And so if we're emitting soot particles into the upper atmosphere, those soot particles may interact with natural cirrus clouds. Similarly, we know that uh, the, the atmosphere is a well-mixed environment. And so those soot particles emitted at 36,000 feet are gonna get mixed down to the surface and may find their way into naturally occurring stratocumulus or cumulus clouds. Um, that, that we might see on an overcast day. And so they may participate and nucleate liquid cloud droplets there as well. And that process is very much removed from the tailpipe or the engine of the air airplane that flew through that space hours or days or weeks prior to that aerosol cloud interaction. And so how you 
sort of rewind the tape, if you will, and attribute a soot particle from an engine to a cloud droplet that may happen, you know, many hundreds of kilometers away or days hence is a difficult problem and one that only a model can give us any sort of realistic answer on. And so that's why when we talk about aerosol cloud interactions, we really struggle with what to make sense of that um, in a in a way that's credible. So it's is it a lot to do with the huge timescales that could differentiate uh, from the emission of the particles towards the actual resulting effect of the interaction? It is. Okay. That's right. Yep. It's it's a huge scale imbalance, both in time and space. And it's also recognizing that aviation is but one of many particle emission sources. And, and actually, we know the predominant um, emission source for low clouds is going to come from the surface, whether it's from the oceans or, or the land. Um, so it, it's complicated. And I, I don't think that we can... I don't think our models are good enough right now of even simulating the natural phenomena with enough accuracy for us then to attribute attribute on an individual particle basis. Oh, this came from a diesel truck on I-95. This came from a Delta Airlines flight flying through the atmosphere. So in the latest David Lee paper on non-CO2 uncertainties in aviation, he does talk about this effect as a, a major reason for us not to move forward with both contrail avoidance or contrail management and also targeted SAF usage. Um, and I couldn't quite understand for, for some time why avoiding or managing contrails would have an effect on aerosol cloud interactions because I, I thought it was more down to the, um, the actual number of aerosol emissions that are released as opposed to what happens to those emissions because it's to do with the actual nucleation of the particles and the processing through a contrail which determines how that aerosol particle will go on to interact with a pre-existing cloud or a natural cloud later down the line. So it could potentially cause a, a large negative forcing effect which is a cooling effect. So the aerosol cloud interactions are, although the uncertainties are still huge, the error bars are still huge. Is it widely thought that they could cause a, a negative effect, so a cooling effect? Yeah, so, so regarding David's latest paper, which I think is excellent, I mean, it's, it's, he's highlighting the right thing. He's highlighting that there's a lot we don't know. And so right now, um, as we think about turning the knob, if you will, to prevent emissions of, of particles in order to avoid a climate effect. Um, we think that the climate effect is warming because we can attribute, we can measure this contrail cirrus climate impact that we, we see as warming. But there's these other effects that we're really struggling to, to quantify. And the one in particular that he's highlighting here is the effect of those soot particles that come from the engines on naturally occurring cirrus. And naturally occurring cirrus are kind of a mysterious animal. So we have water vapor in the upper atmosphere, and there's a lot of it, and it wants to condense and form a cloud, an ice cloud. But it's very clean in the upper atmosphere. There's very few particles around. And so that water has two different pathways that it can approach to forming a cirrus cloud. If there are some particles around that are able to seed those ice crystals, ice nuclei, uh, the water can condense or, or deposit on those nuclei and form an ice crystal. And it's a very different process from what happens in a contrail. It happens uh, in, a, um, in a, a, a different physical mechanism for a natural cirrus cloud. Or if there's not enough nuclei around in the atmosphere, uh, the water becomes so supersaturated that it homogeneously, the water molecules find each other and homogeneously form crystals that, that then uh, form a cloud. And so this competition between 
heterogeneous ice freezing, ice formation on existing ice nuclei and homogeneous freezing in the absence of an ice nuclei has a huge effect on the number of ice crystals that happen in this cirrus cloud and what the radiative impacts are going to be. And so what David and, and the models are, are looking at here is if we start injecting soot particles into the upper atmosphere, we're going to change the number of those ice nuclei, and that's going to disrupt those two different pathways by which cirrus clouds can form. And it may do it in a way that actually has a negative climate effect. Um, and so I think even the, the complexity of that explanation should, should give us some pause that we confidently understand uh, the process here and the effects that, that control management would have on those naturally occurring aerosol cloud interactions. Wow. Not only was this like <laughs> technically uh, very solid, but um, I found it to be even poetic the way you describe <laughs> these water particles to, to find each other. And uh, certainly a good note to end the or wrap up the episode. And um, I think that we've asked you just the right kinds of questions today. There are millions of questions around this. Uh, something that we haven't touched upon is, for example, regulation. But I think that There, there may be other discussions where we could place uh, this topic. And in our tradition for passing on a question to the next guest, um, I'm offering you now the opportunity to pass on a question to Kai Köhler from the German Environment Agency, who will be our next guest. Is there anything at the top of your head that could be asked to Kai? Yeah, absolutely. This has been a great discussion. We've had a lot of fun. And, um, you know, the, the last discussion that we, we had um, got me thinking about what we know and what we don't know. And, and one of the things that's becoming clearer is that, um, that there is a, a, a warming effect from contrails and contrail cirrus clouds that result from them. And so the question that I would ask is, given that, that negative benefit, um, when will there be a price tag placed on contrails? I think he is going to be quite happy about that question. I love it. <laughs> Quick question to you, Rich. You are a PhD. On a scale from, from one to 10, how busy were you uh, just before handing in your PhD thesis, if you can think back? Oh, uh, um, I would say I was very busy. The, the last <laughs> few months of, of the PhD uh, dissertation process was, uh, was a very stressful and uh, busy time. Okay. Yeah. I think I think very busy encapsulates uh, all of what I'm currently going through with my PhD. So, yeah, I think that's what that's what we're alluding to here is the fact that uh, this is my last official occurrence on this show. So we've we've wrapped up the the twelve episodes of this season, and from now onwards, I'm going to be partaking, but it will be on a on a much more sparse basis. So, yeah, if you want to. Elaborate on that, Marius. For sure, for sure. I mean, you already know about um, more amazing guests that we have lined up. So I'm sure that I can be able to tempt you in the future to to still um, come on the show. And of course, uh, the research field that uh, you're working on is so interesting. I can't wait to actually interview you on your results. So we need you to double down now and finish this uh, PhD work. Yep. Um, but of course, for the next uh, couple of months, all the best. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, a big thanks then also to Rich, our guest today. This was a great discussion. Thank you. This was so much fun. Thanks, Rich. <laughs>